Okay, uh, now we're going to start with the second session. Uh, for the second session, we are going to have as contributors Valeria Guzman, Eva Ehlers, and Pablos Filippo. And as the respondent, we are going to have Diana Periton. So, Valeria, please. change in the title, apologies for that. <coughs> what we see here is the cues for one of the three maps used, used as models for the analysis of 34 cities in the fourth Congress of Modern Architecture held in 1953. The fact that these elements are put together in a tabular form is crucial. It enables to see in the same light and within the same order the different elements chosen for comparison and analysis. With this language to hand, CM members codify the city in four categories, dwelling, work, recreation, and transportation. A symbol is assigned to each activity or area taking place within each category. Recreation, for example, is subclassified in gardens, sport grounds, <coughs> open air swimming baths, nautical sports, zoological gardens, and private and municipal golf lawns. The rest of the functions also have their own internal classification with their, own, with their corresponding symbols and terminologies. The idea is that architects will take decisions and formulate proposals by collecting and arranging the information in a unified structure. There is an intention to bring the topic of data manipulation into the symposium. It deli deliberately makes connections with today's use of information <coughs> in the architecture design processes. In particular, those that aim for the creation of streets and the codification of information in order to pursue a specific spatial result. I argue that ways of using data respond to a broader picture of how data ought to be manipulated. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I argue that uh, ways of using data respond to a broader picture of how data ought to be manipulated. I emphasize the word ought because there is a certain prescription in the way information is used which simultaneously comes with an exalted image of what data manipulation can do. That is why CM4 is an example for dealing with these issues. Their approach to urban analysis in the 30s is circumscribed into a specific way both of manipulating data and of producing and organizing documents. My point is that is that if this way of doing fulfills the thoughts and proposals of CM members, it is because they are at ease with a broader picture of how to make objective use of information. But the use of data, despite of aiming to be empirical and objective, that does not necessarily guarantee neither a method nor a result. Let us turn to the map scheme. This tool is important in this discussion because it's closely intertwined with what counts as knowledge of the city for CM4. At the time of the fourth Congress, its president, Cornelius van Isteren, asserted that the, the idea of making use of, of a uniform analytical structure is rooted in the universal understanding of the work, which is very much connected to the development of, ar of architecture today. For such an enterprise, he says, I open quote, we first need an analysis of existing cities according to a unified method, according to identical methods, use of identical symbols and identical colors for identical functions, end of quote. The idea is shared by many members, such as the Spanish architect Jose Lucert, who claims that for the first time, a universal basis for the comparison of cities is established. Hence, 
disparate elements such as slum areas, traffic problems, concentrations of population, locations of industry, and other phases of urban life in communities of widely different character and in different nations and continents could be compared. The amalgamation of different elements in a uniform structure seems to match with Siam purposes, which according to CERT are, are first to classify zones according to their intended functions, and second, to distribute these zones in the most advantageous way. One can see how the tabular array fits into this process of classification and distribution. Actually, its graphic form is already a form of distribution. Tabulation shows an ordering system in which the urban population can be accommodated and, it, um, and in space distributed in the four urban functions. Indeed, when it comes to resolution, Siam four members physically divide the city in functions, residential areas, working areas, recreational areas, and transportation systems. In that sense, tabulation became the fabric of functionalist decision-making processes. A fine example of this can be found in the, the, case, <coughs> the recreational diagram submitted in the Congress based on information about the city of Rotterdam. This graphic table arranges population by age and displays the leisure activities suitable for each age group. These activities should be part of recreation units organized in green areas surrounding the dwellings. Recommendations then are set while children from the age to six from the age two to six need areas with a sandbox, a paved area and a water basin. Children from six to 15 years need playground areas composed of small, gro small grass plots. One can see that the graphic table works as a tool through which functionalist architects can put their ideas into operation. Actually, it is as if by having the appropriate information disposed in, a, disposed in an ordered system, people can be distributed and the city can be, re, can be organized. Of course, the tabular array is not an exclusive tool for urban analysis. It is used as basis for decision making in other disciplines, such as sociology, medicine, politics, economics. But it is also a style of reasoning which has been pervasive in the 20th century. It sign signals the extent to which functionalist architects are, are part of a wider system which creates subjects able to organize and rationalize information. For this, it will be useful to briefly show first the persistent presence of the tabular array in different fields of operation, and second, the, document the documentary form in which tabulation is inscribed. The tabular array is a recent invention. Its layout is of a modern sort. That is to say, data is organized in the page for guiding the process of decision making. <coughs> this is the case, for example, of a, of a table displaying the tabulation of Paris in 1873, classified by occupation, place of residence, rate of, of mortality, etc. urban planners, sociologists, and other experts can draw conclusions from the shading labels, labels indicated in the table. Or a table published in 1870 in which 900 distances from one English city to another can be calculated. Having these distances at hand, the, in, the individual can decide, for example, where to go first or which means of transport to use. Or the table of shape profiles designed by Francis Galton in 1910, in which the human profile is codified into seven shapes with ten possible variations for each shape. The idea is to create a uniform and efficient method for identification of criminals in order to transmit and, ch and exchange the data to those interested in despite of their geographical location. What is at stake here? is a form of reading based on analysis and, compar of, and comparison of data that is simultaneously a guide for action and decision. Consequently, this new layout comes with people able to read, use, and organize data in that way. Hence, it 
becomes a common procedure useful for many disciplines and architecture is not the exception. CM4 very much welcome tabulation and the form of reading it implies as the, mean, as the means to rationalize urban space. In urbanism and architecture since the 19th century, tabulation is accompanied by a search of, for, met for methods of documentation, the organization of documents, and the analysis of the documentation. Indeed, there is an enormous body of documents that functionalist architects prepare for, analog for, a, for analysis, which is composed of maps, questionnaires, extensive reports, and publications. There is this, for example, is the first of 14 sheets of the document, of the document that was <coughs> selected as, as the model for a large-scale po publication of Siam for achievements. It displays a city already codified and translated in graphic tables. Uh, velocity of wind, prevalent direction of winds, maximum and minimum temperature levels, etc. This other is the report of the city of the south submitted for the fourth congress containing 48 pages of tables, photographs, texts, and diagrams, the report is representative of, of that which counts as valid material for an objective urban analysis. Above, above all, there is a great deal of conviction deposited in the document. Hence, the idea is that, that, that having collected this vast knowledge, having organized the document, and especially having integrated all the data into a single structure, architects will easily find the right conclusions. There is almost an expectation that urban space will arrange itself. However, when the 90 participants of the 16 countries meet in the Congress with all this data accumulated and arranged, Le Corbusier raises a crucial question. How are we make use of this prodigious material? So one can see that although this body of documents are meant to provide the solutions, the problem of, of organizing urban space is still an open question. However, in economics, this way of collecting information and formulate proposals is strongly criticized during the late 1930s and early, early 1940s by the Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek. His concern points towards the optimization of the use of knowledge in an economic system. Certainly, this brings us closer to today's forms of data manipulation in architectural design processes, especially, especially those in which a set of parameters is attached to the object of design in order to make changes and variations. That is to say, in order to manip manipulate the object in an efficient and complex way. But let's turn to our Austrian economist. In his article, The Use of Knowledge in Society, Hayek criticized the role of a central authority collecting, integrating, and coordinating all the knowledge in order to make decisions and generate economic policies. The problem, according to Hayek, is first that before issuing any policy, all the crucial information has to put at the disposal of a central board, and second, that there is no assurance that this information, when transmitted, is in fact relevant. We cannot assume that all this significant data can be absorbed and processed by a single authority, such that they will be able to establish, this, to establish policies and solutions. <coughs> In a market economy, relevant data is generated by day-to-day -day adjustments, which a, central board, which a central board cannot record. Actually, economic problems, says Hayek, arise always as a, consequence, as a consequence of change and modifications. In his words, the continuous flow of goods and services is maintained by the cost and delivery adjustments, by new dispositions made every day in the light of circumstances not known the day before, by B stepping in at once when A fails to deliver. Hayek suggests that instead of a single mind, is of a single mind issuing economic policies that ultimately do not respond to the spontaneous order of the market, uh, we need a system where the knowledge of the pertinent facts is put at the disposal of those interested. He says then that the price can act as a coordinator of the heterogeneous actions 
of different people because the crucial information will be condensed in this numerical index. <coughs> Hence, in any small change, the individual will have to consider only these quantity, quantitative indices. And by adjusting the quantities one by one, he can rearra rearrange his dispositions without having to solve the whole puzzle from the beginning or without needing, needing at any stage to serve it at once in all its ramifications. In short, in the price system, only this, the fundamental information circulates so lightly to those wh whom this data is of concern. Fundamentally, it is a system in which individuals will operate in the desirable, desirable way without anyone having to tell them what to do. When change and adjustment enter as the fundamental component of market economies, parametric equations come onto the scene. By changing the assumed values of a set of fixed parameters, economists can test alternative scenarios in order to make decisions for different kinds of, tra of transactions. So we can see how well contemporary manipulation of data and architectural processes fits into this economic conception. Parametric design, for example, is able to create changes and variations in an, in an object of design, such as a building, a component of a building, or an urban field. It allows the creation of versions and transformations, both in the building and in the, in the system in which the building is inscribed. But more important, it, each object contains the necessary data for its manipulation. It's not my intention here to say that either method is better or worse than the other. Hayek account of the price system makes evident that ways of organizing information are, are part of styles of reasoning, which in turn make some uses of data desirable and others not. <coughs> it makes architects believe in certain methods and distrust others. Nowadays, the manner in which information is manipulated in architecture differs from the mode of operation of the functionalist architects in the 1930s. But the question posed by Le Corbusier, that of how, having organized all this data, we are to make use of this prodigious material, remains open. Thank you. Welcome. Um, this paper looks at um, what was actually new about the hygienic style. The 19th century witnessed the emergence of a number of new institutions, such as banks, offices, or prisons. Many of these institutions, though, related to the specialization of medical treatment. My interest is focused on the tuberculosis sanatorium which I consider here as an important influence for modern urban planning. My thesis traces the sanatorium's development from its first appearance in the mid-19th century to its time of decline in the 1940s, when a pharmaceutical cure <coughs> against tuberculosis became available. Most sanatoria were placed in natural surroundings and did not have to relate to an immediate architectural or urban context. So what makes the sanatorium so interesting is that because of its particular positioning in relation to the city, because it had been <coughs> distanced from the city center, and because of its relation to medical practices and public policies, the sanatorium became a space of experimentation in terms of spatial organization in terms of testing different systems for communal life, but also in terms of formal expression. Since the sanatorium proved to be a complete failure in curing tuberculosis, it is surprising how it became such an influential figure within modernism. Therefore, it's important to look, which this paper aims to do, 
at the various ways in which the sanatorium was promoted at the time as modern, healthy, scientifically justified and therefore new to the public. The thesis research is framed in relation to a number of case studies, which include the Paimio Sanatorium by Alvar Alto and the Sonnestral Sanatorium by Johannes Dauke. These examples are representatives of the hygienic or functional style with its machinistic, with its machinistic aesthetics expressed in the flat roofs, white walls, and the white glass planes which became a canon for the later sanatorium architecture. A less known case study are the Belitz Heilstätten, a vast sanatorium complex built between 1898 and 1930 by a German state insurance company in order to diminish, to diminish the severe financial losses caused by tuberculosis. The complex planned to host more than a thousand patients was realized within an era of 200 hectare of woodland close to Berlin. Providing its own infrastructure, from heating to electricity plant to growing their own food, it became almost independent from the outside world. Since there was no pharmaceutical cure available until the 1940s, the sanatorium had been created to strengthen the patient's defense against the infection and thus to enable for healthy living in general. The principles of hygiene, which were then associated with isolation <coughs> and disinfection on the one hand and exposure of the body to sun and fresh air on the other, became essential to the formation of the building type of the TB sanatorium. During the discussed period of time, which is 1900 till 1935, the medical practices of the cure, determining the internal arrangement of the building, did not change significantly. <coughs> the use of the terrace system and the general fenestration, as well as the spatial organization strictly separating the service structures from the patient's areas, together with the general importance paid to washable, hygienic, and therefore smooth, unornamented, and light-colored surfaces, were already employed for the very first sanatoria, although their outside appearance implied a rather different interior. And often a distinctly modern internal space was hiding behind neo-Gothic walls. Looking at the sanatorium's development over time, we find in many cases <coughs> this discrepancy between internal organization based on the principles of hygiene strictly bound to medical and organizational necessities and efficiency, and the treatment of the facade, the so-called style of the building. While the typical arrangement altered little over time, the appearance and the communication with what was beyond the building changed frequently. Already with the first sanatorium purely dedicated to the treatment of tuberculosis, we find the beginnings of a practice that used the facade as a surface to apply the most fashionable style, which made sense since the building had to be trusted in providing a new, up-to-date and effective cure against the lung disease. Secondly, the facade provided a means through which to articulate different understandings of what a sanatorium was to be, from the neo-Gothic castle of the worker to a home for the sick to the machine of health. Within this development, I see two movements or moments which present a rupture here since they differ fundamentally from the tradition of the rather random adaptation of facade styles. One moment would be certainly the use of the hygienic style. Here the, the discrepancy in aesthetic um, appearance between the interior and the exterior has been resolved but yet the facade had, as I will argue, nothing to do with being the logical outcome of the internal functional arrangement as which it had been promoted. The second moment, dating about 30 years earlier, would be the use of the Belitz style, which, um, where we still find a distinct discrepancy between the appearance of the building inside and its facade 
while for the first time both interior arrangement and facade serve the same distinct curative purpose. What I would like to refer um, to as the billet style was a peculiar mixture of English country house and German Heimat style introduced during this first realization phase of the complex around 1900. In the Bielitz Heilstätten, the outside and the inside played in the system of the cure two distinct roles. The internal arrangement mirrors the new system of therapeutic and medical policies, while the exterior answers to traditional architectural elements. Despite its difference in appearance, the facade was perfectly complementing the inner building arrangement since both served the same overall function, the cure. The use of the white hygienic and signal color for the facade was avoided in order to blend more naturally or modestly with its surroundings. And the park landscape, which was supposed to be an active therapeutic environment, was thus staged and complemented through the buildings. The chosen style, the use of the pitched roof of exposed timber framing, color glazed brickwork, cast iron balcony details and an altogether very vivid color scheme had furthermore the function to confront the patients with a different scale version of what they were somehow familiar with and what they could associate with being rooted in a German pre-industrial past. I would describe the peculiar Belitz style as being beyond fashionable since it was reflecting an image which could be widely understood and accepted at the time as deriving from a true German building tradition in order to help the patient to consolidate him with his nature. The Belitz style can be regarded as an active element of the curing process and therefore would deserve being called functional and inventive much more than the so-called hygienic style. But of course it was the hygienic style first used for the Sonnestal sanatorium and not the Belitz, which was at the time promoted as fundamentally new and true to the respective functional requirements and spatial arrangements, altogether as the logic architectural outcome of the demands of medical sciences. While with the hygienic style, the idea of the reconciliation with nature, the collaboration with the natural side was, I would argue, reversed. A part of the sanatorium's original functionality was here lost and substituted by the building itself, the medical machine. Described as having at its, at its base the general striving for health in any field of human life, this formal expression first described by Johannes Dauker as sanitary in its basic construction, execution and interior arrangement, and thus encompassing the whole building inside as outside was said to be more than just another style. Instead, it was to foster and enable for physical and mental well-being, social betterment. Even the new culture was to merge from the science of hygiene and technique with the hygienic style as a means to promote the healthy and correct way of living. But while the hygienic style mirrored the looks or the appearance of the inside to the outside, I would argue that it certainly didn't respond any more to the curative demands of tuberculosis than the Bielitz style had done years earlier. And so the actual medical necessity leading to the hygienic style's formation is here questioned. The advantage of the hygienic style was that it gave the sanatorium the most modern appearance. The white plain facades became a sign for the building to be imbued with its function while if this function was purely to provide the most hygienic environment, there was no need for the facade to take on any particular color or surface shape. But the hygienic style served a very different purpose. Far from being the necessary formal outcome of an overall building concept, the style served in my eyes mainly two strategic purposes. First, it had to make the inside readable and radiate an image of right, healthy living, and thus educate a wider public. Second, it had to demonstrate a certain social-political endeavor 
speed for specific trade unions or a newly elected socialist government. But most certainly, there was no medical reason for whitewashing, tiling, and smoothing the building's outside shell. As much as the curative demands influencing the inner arrangement as well as the relationship with the city had stayed <coughs> the same over time, the relationship with the building's direct surrounding with nature changed significantly through the use of the hygienic style. Through examining here in more detail this changing relationship, I would like to draw attention to the shift from the understanding of the TB sanatorium as a mainly curative space focusing on the patients inhabiting it, to the sanatorium understood as a medical machine with its focus more on radiating an image of healthy life than on the cure itself. Where in Belitz we find a number of attractions placed along the extensive system of walkways, from opportunities to play games to especially creative views, Paimio presents us with a cross-country ski track-like walking path running back and forth in between five equally designed fountains, constituting rather an extension to the building than an attempt to engage with the site. From Belitz to Sonnestral to Paimio, we find an increasing degree of independence from the ground. We see, the, um, we see in the case of Sonnestral and later Paimio, and again, Although the emphasis on the engagement with nature and its function in the medical cure had never been altered, a clear shift towards the abstraction of nature until the point where it is not important anymore if the patient saw actual trees in front of the window or something representing that. In Belitz, the building opens up towards the outside and one had to walk through the carefully designed parkscape every day to reach the pavilions for the daybed cure. And so the idea of integrating the surrounding, of enabling for a direct experience of nature with all senses, was central to the architectural organization. In case of Sonnestral, the patient was still encouraged to walk to the workshops dedicated to the occupational therapy, which were spread in the surrounding woodlands. But in a sense, it is already here less the engagement and more the view of nature which is provided for by the building. But where the sonestral still keeps the patient in contact with the ground, although a little wall carefully protects them from rolling onto it, Paimio <coughs> renounces the ground floor access for the patients altogether and instead makes them <coughs> look at nature from the seventh floor roof terrace or from a carefully designed window frame. In Pania, which actually was designed from the view of the reclining patient, the body is placed more and more in a receptive position within the medical machine, and any active engagement with the surrounding is avoided. Through the hygienic style, and despite the extensive fenestration, the building closed itself to its surroundings. It inhibits direct communication with the outside, which instead is filtered and internalized. The building at this point does it all, even substituting the lacking winter sun through a yellow staircase. Through not trying to blend into its surroundings anymore, but on the contrary, trying with all means to stand out, the sanatorium gradually became more and more emancipated independent from its collaboration with nature and from the site. Through enabling for this complicated, ambiguous relationship with the surrounding, promoting to open up while at the same time distancing itself from any particular site, the use of the hygienic style supported the sanatorium's endeavor of becoming a perfect medical and universal machine. In adapting the hygienic style, the sanatorium distances itself from nature, also through its choice of material. And where this is still natural brickwork, as in case of the Paimio, it has to be thoroughly hidden, painted over, and whitewashed. But it was not only the naturalness of the brickwork which was unacceptable to display, but the fact that it seemed old-fashioned compared with the new and noble materials such as iron, glass, or cement. <coughs> 
Since from Berlitz to Palmio, there had been a shift of priorities, demanding on the one side the emphasis of the traditional, on the other side the emphasis of the new, certain treatment of material had thus to be hidden in both cases. Where Palmio had to cover up its uninvented traditional use of brickwork, as had done the Bauhaus, by the way, Belitz had to disguise or embellish, however unsuccessfully, the structurally invented use of exposed steel beams. Here, the tension between expressing habit and tradition on the one side, modern organization and structural <coughs> invention on the other, <coughs> becomes apparent. Questioning the said to be functional hygienic style in terms of being true to the needs of health and hygiene, true to material use and structural exposure. The paper examined whether it was not Belitz, which was more responsive to the medical theory of the time, possibly even deserved the attribute invented in structural terms, and was thus more functional and new than the later Pioneer Sonnestral, which became to be known as iconic and revolutionary. Furthermore, a shift was traced in the use of the facade from Belitz to Palmio. Generally, you could say that between 1900 and 1930, the sanatorium was moved more and more into the public eye, since it had been discovered as an interesting instrument of propaganda, as a universal structure adaptable to any surroundings and also applicable to less favorable ones. The modernist sanatorium, I would argue, merely happens to have patients inhabiting it. Instead, it focuses more on promoting a strategic image, on radiating the idea of a healthy way of living, and on passing as an indicator of governmental success. The building thus fails to concentrate on its first and foremost function, to provide the best curative environment against tuberculosis. Thank you. In recent years, cultural buildings have proliferated widely as keystones within strategies of urban development and regeneration. In this, a notion that is problematized fairly consistently is that of newness, and in a double sense, both as resource and as ambition. This can be discerned even with a glimpse on the titles of some current publications on cultural buildings. For example, museums. New museums, museums for a new millennium, New Museum Theory and Practice, New Museum Architecture, Towards a New Museum. Clearly not that inventive. In these writings, we repeatedly encounter claims that Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao is an emblematic instance of this lineage. This presentation proposes to develop a concise investigation of a limited series of case studies which, while analyzing the Guggenheim's innovations and regularities, will be revealing a the main of argument regarding the urban cultural field. How is, the, uh, how is the Guggenheim seen as new in these publications? Well, it is often understood as innovative in the sense of a new kind of design, where an unusual materiality actualizes unfamiliar forms themselves predicated on uncommon geometries. Second, it is asserted as new in the sense of being dramatically differentiated from its context, both in terms of its morphology and its urbanism. That is, it is, not of, it is not only formally dissimilar from the 19th century fabric in its vicinity, but it is also distinct in its strategic contribution to an industrial conurbation attempting to reinvigorate itself as a city of culture. Third, it is also assumed to be new in the sense of institutionally being open to the wider public while contributing to a general cultural development. 
On closer inspection, can these claims verify the Guggenheim is supposed new novelty? In other words, is it really new that cultural institutions take the burden of our cultivations of, of our cultivation as urban subjects? and that they do so through our pedagogical instruction and voluntary reformation responding to a present promise of self-improvement? Finally, is the Guggenheim's urban role really new? We might begin to reflect on this by noticing that they seem less indicative of a new urban condition and more a watershed in the codification and intensification of more than a century's long experimentation with cultural buildings for the latter have had a distinctive yet unstable role to play within urbanism, as this is witnessed in cases as early as Vienna's Ringstrasse from the late 19th century to Tony Garnier's Cité Industrielle from the early 20th. That is to say, the, Guggenheim, the Guggenheim's architectural singularity has prompted many to register it also as an event in urbanism, Whereas we might want to consider it as belonging to an extended series of cultural buildings whose strategic role in urbanism seems more a point of, of departure rather than a point of contention. Cultural buildings reside at the pivot point where architecture, urbanism, and culture intersect and become mutually interdependent. A project like the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao can be seen as an occasion of how architecture can make culturally available for urbanism a particular and often significant part of the city. In the aforementioned publications and many others on cultural buildings, it is interesting to note that in spite or perhaps because of the evident amplification of formal experimentation, there seems a certain persistence and pervasiveness of the iconographic by which is meant an articulation of both semantic and semiotic references. In other words, the iconographic currently subsists as a privileged diagrammatic qualification of cultural buildings, that is, of what is conventionally demanded from them, to epitomize our aesthetic aspirations, to exemplify an innovative response, and to represent our cultural sophistication. The corollary of this seems almost invariably to be a scenographic disposition which positions cultural buildings in selected urban locales, usually as pavilions in open space. In this sense, cultural buildings conventionally perform as urban monuments by organizing the experience of key scenes in the city. The decisive issue to notice here is that scenography and iconography are not merely incorporated as a strategic effect in the urban but they also dominate our reading of the urban. To briefly insinuate an argument that will be later developed a bit further, this dominance exerted by the iconic and the scenic seems an unsolicited legacy of the critiques of modernism going back to the 1960s and 70s. Instead, we, mi we might want to reflect upon these two, not only as distinct, but also as two of many possible approaches this investigation aspires by operating at the dual registers of organizational specificity, which is typology, and reasoning on, uh, on urban form, which is morphology, to precisely open up such a line of inquiry. Conversely to the conventional understanding of typomorphology being a sterile grid for retrospective classification, this paper follows Alan Conhoon's initiative in his examination of Le Corbusier's concepts. Here, Colhoun's argument is that Le Corbusier's work is innovative in that there is a primary acceptance and subsequent reinterpretation of architecture's material and tradition, um, working on both levels, uh, buildings and drawings. For our purposes here, there is no need to expansively survey the material and formal practices of Garris's office. It seems sufficient to know that the computational sophistication embedded in the design processes, as well as the consecutive feedback loops between sketching and both digital and physical modeling, in an extended exploration of the object's visual form. Hence, a project's design development relies less upon the use of standard architectural representations, such as plans, sections, axonometric drawings, which are constructed with the use of uh, projective geometries.
If these lots were understood as tools for the pursuit of structure and organization in architecture, one can see how this disposition tends to diminish their importance in terms in quest of collective effect. Formulated differently, this foregrounding of the building's visual materiality and external configuration is worn through the subordination of organization to figuration. This is regularly supplemented with the ground acquiring the role of a foundational and assertive datum upon which the, the building figures as an architectural event. In the specific case of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, this is accomplished on the one hand, with the museum stepping back from its street front, articulating an open public space in between its massing and the city's tissue. On the other, the river promenade steps out over the edge of the south bank of the Nervion, the river, in order to distantiate the viewer from the building and facilitate a more intense visual experience. This latter effect is amplified by the creation of an artificial lake between the bridging promenade and the museum, multiplying its play of form and light. This is because the museum is articulated as a singular yet heterogeneous, sorry, um, while in these attributes we can recognize that the Guggenheim has successfully orchestrated an impressive scenographic achievement across a range of urban scales, the interrelation between its placement and the vectors and voids of the fabric around it s seems somewhat paradoxical. That is, that is, the organization of the corresponding interior voids and vectors seems to contradict what the building's placement is attempting, which is to demonstrate what architecture can do between at the confrontation between urban fabric and the riverfront. This is because the museum is articulated as a singular yet heterogeneous set of volumes along the south embankment, acting more as a physical boundary than as connected connective tissue between river and city. This seems corroborated by the creation of a primary open public space on what can now be termed as the side of the city allowing only spaces for promenade behind it. Yet, both sides take the, ha the challenge of producing affects upon an I... Sorry, this noise keeps <laughs> grabbing my attention. Yet, both sides take the challenge of producing affects upon an iconic common ground while relinquishing the opportunity to stratify the section and channel the building's internal activity in such a way as to charge its, its different voids. Evidently, a building cannot exploit all the possibilities embedded in a waterfront. Yet, to avoid seeing the river promenade as a thing in itself seems to have never been a priority. This argument might be continued through the building's sectional articulation. For all its iconoclastic material repertoire, the museum adheres entirely to the time-honored convention of cultural civic manipulation of the ground which comprises, which comprises, uh, sorry. For all its, its iconoclastic material repertoire, the museum en adheres entirely to the time-honored convention of cultural civic manipulation of the ground, which comprises a sequence of road, open space, podium circle, which acts as a disengagement device, formal entrance, imposing foyer and atrium, continuing through a series of inter independent yet interlaced spaces, which in museum architecture are traditionally termed as an enfilade of galleries. Such an articulation is so prevailing that it is encountered in most cultural buildings. Precedents range from Carl Friedrich Schinkel's Altes Museum in Berlin, to Charles Garnier Opera in Paris, to Columbia University's Law Library by McKim, Mead and White, to Henri van der Velde's Workwound Theatre in Cologne, to Colin St. John Wilson's British Library in London, to Norman Foster's Carré d'Art in Nîmes. The only major difference between the Guggenheim and most of these counter case studies is that the circle is sectionally lower rather than elevated in relation to the open space. This is in accord with the designation of the lower of, of its three floors as the primary access level so that the ground plane of the foyer is sectionally aligned with that of the river promenade. To pursue this a bit further, a comparison can be made with Lina Bobardi's Museum of Art in Sao Paulo, 
and Afonso Eduardo Raidi's Museum of Modern Art in Rio de Janeiro. In both these, this role of the ground is evaded not, on, not only due to the amal amalgamation of public space in Soho, as well as the rejection of a, a monumental entrance, but also and primarily because the museum, or at least a substantial part of it, hovers above the open space, allowing the realm of public life to transverse the site while shielding it from both rain and sun. In terms of planimetric organization, the Guggenheim I Museum in Bilbao is geometrically articulated around a multi-story atrium, which is distinguished from the vestibule and topologically central in relation to the exhibition spaces. In this, the museum's conformity to the canon of the enfilade of galleries around the central foyer rotunda, which are sequentially and serially interlinked, becomes evident once the more graphical illustrative plans are examined, conversely to the more composite notational drawings. Again, a juxtaposition can be drawn here, this time with Ms. van der Rohe's new National Gallery in Berlin, a comparison pertaining to both planimetric and sectional manipulation. In this case, not, o not only has the division between the podium and open space been collapsed, but the primordial role of the ground is peculiarly rendered unstable. For the building's organization and materiality allows the fabric in its vicinity to come to vibrancy and vitality by the receding qualities of its architecture. This seems as the diagrammatic opposite of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, for unlike the latter's imposing monumentality, which consummates the figure ground dialectic, the former is coordinated more as a figure-figure structure which hovers between an autonomous object, that is a pavilion uh, amidst open space, and the fabric building which colonizes its whole site with its very buried and interiorized program. Then again, the Guggenheim's sectional handling is more successful in its integration within its context infrastructural network. Here, we can only hint at how this predicament is positioned within a, within a wider urban pro problematic where architecture can take the burden of mediation between different kinds of weave and grain in the fabric while responding to topographical variation. Again, we might concisely contrast this with a case like OMA's Kunsthall in Rotterdam Abalos and Herreros' Uzero Library in Madrid, or more recently Zaha Hadid's Finos Science Center in Wolfsburg, where the section is extensively and intensively negotiated in multiple frame frameworks, not just infrastructural, but also institutional and organizational. It is this receptive reading of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, associated with the iconic and the scenic, which led critics to assume that such a disposition is unproblematically repeatable, since it apparently constitutes a paradigm of what architectural urbanism can do in a prominent city setting. This seems to be the case both for other cultural institutions commissioned after the Guggenheims around the world, as well as other singular buildings alo along Bilbao's river esplanade with diminishing value in a recurring urban strategy. Now, rather, rather than seeing this simply as erroneous, we might note how it designates a dispersal in the field ever since the typological and semiological writings of the 1960s and 70s and their contemporary and ensuing practice. On the one hand, architects such as Robert Venturi condemned modernism, semantic and semiotic reductivism while indicating their sedimented richness in historical precedents. While Venturi's design practices are evidently distinct from those of Gehry, we can nevertheless note how their disparity is premised on exploiting similar resources such as the availability of the sign with different aspirations. Whereas the former operates within a regime of established signs through disjunction, the latter attempts to tran transgress the regularities of this domain through a radical plasticity. This has further implications in the instrumentality of organization. Venturis' complexity and contradiction val valorizes the tactical discrepancies between organization and signification, while Gary, as we have observed, focuses on the unconventional handling of the envelope in tandem with the robust affirmation of the ground as datum. 
On the other hand, the Italian rationalists attempted to restore architecture status in the urban condition by underlying their intimate, the intimate and reciprocal relations between the two. Typology was forged as a central concept in this endeavor, generating a pattern of reasoning both for analyzing historical precedent and for <coughs> projecting conceptual displacements. While typology's raison d'etre might have been clear, its initial deployment seems to oscillate awkwardly between its organizational and semiological attributes. It is in this context that Aldo Rossi investigates both primary elements and monuments on the same register. Yet, this should not be seen as an epistemological confusion, but as an index of a discursive shift available ever since modernism enabled architecture to place the building's envelope and its organization on different registers, freeing the facade to generate meaning ir irrespective of interior manipulation. Gary, beyond the profound differences with Rossi, seems to follow this same trajectory in conflating these two thereby stressing the role of scenography and iconography in the city. The Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao's uh, considerable focus and accomplishment was the articulation of an exotic material assemblage comprised by the building Selven and morphology in conjunction with an ossification in the status of its ground. In this, the project has surrendered to the disposition of the ruling cultural diagram, which prompts us toward the scenographic's pursuit of affect and the iconographic's quest for signification. As has been suggested, this is not a flawed approach. Yet, if there is a failure, then this would be the failure to exploit a broader spectrum of possibilities. Formulated differently, the Guggenheim has suppressed the possibility for organizational experimentation, especially in the multiplication of the ground, even when it, when it was more difficult to do so considering the topographical discontinuity between the level of the urban fabric and that of the river promenade. We began with the claims on the Guggenheim's, cl uh, sorry, we began with the claims on the Guggenheim's novelty as a cultural building for framing an investigation of both its innovations and regularities. What we have learned is that the building like the Guggenheim acting as a diagram describes specific roles for culture and public space in efforts to regenerate cities in the wake of industrial decline and the, and the rise of long age economies. In this particular example, we see how architecture looks outward, defining a strategy for urban transformation, while doing so with an organizational schema that remains quite rooted in the tradition of cultural institutions and buildings. It does little to look forward or innovate, this would be the role of an architecture that takes full advantage of typological reasoning, probing the capacity of architecture to, to offer a fertile avenue of inquiry through internal transformation. Thank you.
just because I have a similar job to Theresa's, and I, I haven't been um, quite as bold in that I haven't actually tried to relate this session. I haven't tried to relate this session to the others. I was looking at this one rather more hermetically. Um, and before opening things up to questions that might highlight the specificities of the three papers, I want to make a, a bit of an attempt, however awkward it might be, to look at things that might tie them together. Um, and one of them is actually uh, to do with slightly moving away from the, the way that the papers themselves pitch their questioning of the new, their questioning of newness, or certainly the way that Pavlos and Evers' uh, papers pitch that questioning. Um, that, if I understand it rightly, and I, I mean this is a, a vast oversimplification, Pavlos is questioning of the newness of Guggenheim Bilbao as a cultural building is to do with suggesting that in fact there's much more continuity with cultural buildings of the 19th century. Um, that there's a continuity with their architecture, with their cultural role, with their role within urbanism. And that actually Gary has not in any way affected the kind of displacement of concepts that Alan Colquhoun looks at, um, for instance, in the, in the work of Le Corbusier. Um, Gary is actually lying on it, relying on extremely familiar concepts. Um, and then to move on to Evers, um, questioning the newness of the, the hygienic style, um, suggesting that newness actually lay, first of all, in the formulation of the sanatorium as an institution in the middle of the 19th century, and then in the way that that emerged as a, as a building type in the late 19th century. Um, and that what's associated with its newness, its new, newness of expression in the 1930s is probably the least new thing. Um, and so I suppose I, I felt that they were looking at newness um, to do with the kind of overdetermined negation uh, that I think was Pedro's phrase this morning. Um, and then I think Valeria didn't actually identify anything in particular as, as new, um, but the suggestion is that, that parametric design, I suppose, is not altogether new. Um, and I think maybe the, the newness or the lack of it that, that you're pointing towards perhaps holds a key to linking the three papers. Um, and I'm imagining Imagining that you're looking at newness more in terms of, say, the questions that somebody like Thomas Kuhn raises in the structure of scientific revolutions or something like that, where it's a newness, it might be to do with a change in taxonomic categories, for instance, um, or it might be to do with a change of a model or a metaphor or an analogy. Um, and I think, um, I, I'm not sure that what you were look, looking at were precise newnesses in, in, in any of those with the, the functional <coughs> city, but it was sort of heading towards um, what might be new about these cognitive processes, um, what might be new about the way that um, we describe or represent things to ourselves and therefore how we come to know them, how we come to conceptualize them. Um, and with CIAM's functional city, you were describing a new way of identifying what you called a system of equivalence or systems of equivalences through tabulation and the use of kind of iconic uh, indices that allowed the space of the city to be seen as something <coughs> at least potentially continuous and isotro isotropic. So you were looking at these uh, processes that uh, Sert and Van Eysteren called 
universalizing. They were processes that allowed everything to be subjected to identical methods. And that one of the things that was going on is uh, seeing space, whether it's the, the space of the table or the space of the city, um, as this continuous isotropic um, possibility that can then be differentiated according to functioning. That you talked about it as a style of reason that requires that subjects rationalize space. And I took that to mean that, that they create a kind of compound category of space, which is space plus its use, space plus its function, or space plus its occupation. And I wondered if this way of uh, thinking about space, conceptualizing space as continuous and equal, but also differentiable, could provide a way of thinking again about the newnesses or lack of them um, described in their different ways by Eva and by Pavlos. Um, and so to start with, with Eva's, um, you introduced the sanatorium as being something that uh, didn't have to relate to its immediate surroundings, that was kind of tucked away in the forest somewhere. Um, but of course, once one starts looking at the CIAM um, four categories, the forest is one of those categories. It has become part of the um, continuous space of urbanism, the continuous space of the region. Um, and so I suppose I, I began to think about your different sanatoria examples and whether to what extent it made sense to think of them in terms of space as this continuous universalizing field um, that's available to differentiation. And so I wondered if, if you would, d do you think one can do that, for instance, with the Baylitz um, sanatorium? Does it make sense as a way of thinking about this? Or is it just perverse? no such space which is in no relation with, with the city at that time. And um, something like Baylitz, for example, had to choose its place very carefully to be not too far away from the realm of the city so it could still be reachable by the patient and the medical staff, of course. So they couldn't put it somewhere, I don't know, more than, say, 100 kilometers away. So it was, of course, at the borderline the city, but still far enough away in order not to be influenced by, yeah, say, the dirt and, and the dirt of the city. So it was more, again, an image that they needed, so they <coughs> needed a big patch of woodland where to place it in, but it didn't need to be really far away from, from the center. And you talked about the, the Baylitz one in terms of uh, the Mutesius kind of country house, uh, English country house in Cambridgeshire, mm -hmm. um, where I always think of that to be with um, a kind of pre-modern thinking or pre-modern movement thinking about function, where it's to do with kind of the organism itself, so that if one thinks of the the way that the Baylitz Sanatorium organizes its spaces and the way that its facades relate to the organization of those spaces, through Mutasius's terms, it would be seeing the Baylitz Sanatorium as a kind of organism unto itself. Whereas I wonder whether once one starts to think about space in these much more universalizing terms of the functioning city, uh, whether it's the whole city that has become an organism. Um, so I suppose what I'm getting at here is, is there perhaps a different 
if one thinks about uh, a change, a shift in the concept of space, is that a way that might allow one to think of the sanatoria of the 20s and 30s with me again? So I'm not discrediting your argument of saying that they're kind of lost to me. I'm saying that perhaps there is another way of looking at them through the terms of Valeria's thinking, which would um, give them a different kind of newness, um, which is almost to do with thinking of the, the whole of the city as a sanatorium, um, which then affects what one would be doing with the facades of individual buildings. Yes. Um, also, I didn't, I didn't try or I didn't want to imply from, from the paper that, you know, this sanatorium is like a pioneer or the Sonny Strauss very much very different from the Felix in terms also of internal organization. There was, of course, a difference and it was not completely the same, but I was speaking really mainly about the formal expression here and how it presented itself to, to the outside. Um, I think in, in terms of you know, relating the sanatorium to the city, um, I would see that the Felix, given that it really tried to imitate sort of the functions of the city, like inside, like very literally in having um, all these functions as heating plants and growing warm food and being self-sufficient as such, you could, you could really understand it as a self functioning organism. And I think all these animal um, elements somehow can be traced again in, in something like the pioneer on, on a very different scale, obviously. Or there was an attempt really to, to um, <coughs> translate that into this um, modern day sanatorium, so to speak. I guess then my next question is, that, and this is all to do with kind of private papers together a bit, is um, wondering to what extent uh, Pavlos's way of arguing might be brought to bear on Heather's sanatorium um, that um, to do with your way of describing the way that architecture and urbanism, if, if we've sort of established that the sanatorium can be seen as part of urbanism, um, and your way of describing how architecture and urbanism come together in the cultural building, and you talk about that <coughs> through the way that the ground is articulated, um, which I suppose in my way of trying to relate the three, I'm assuming has something again to do with the conceptualization of space and the way that uh, space is then differentiated. Um, and also how that then informs um, the relationship of an internal organization and uh, an iconic or scenographic organization. Um, could you see your argument then being brought to bear on Heather's examples? Um. Yes, I think um, there are a, a series of commonalities and similarities, as, as of course there are differences. Um, uh, clearly, you know, on, on the level, let's say, of, uh, of herpology, um, which is an organizational specificity, as opposed to uh, some sort of uh, more conventional understanding, if we understand that this herpology has been this organizational specificity, then um, the way you define uh, a continuity is, is not on, on what you, I guess the best term to use is, is, is a journal distinction. So um, a museum is a journal. It designates a journal of buildings as opposed to a typology of buildings. Um, and I'm, I'm claiming implicitly that what the genres that constitute what we can generally call cultural buildings actually have uh, display a certain regularity 
uh, in, in their typology. Now, um, having granted this difference, uh, I think there are a few uh, commonalities and similarities in the sense that um, the disparity um, I'm uh, indicating in between the, the, the handling of the envelope and the, and the articulation of organization, which is something the modern movement uh, brought to their difference, uh, exemplified their difference even, uh, I think it, it is very clear also in, in the sanatoria. So you have this whole uh, distinction being uh, brought up and problematized. So I think there is this common ground. Um, y yet in, in uh, again, a, a kind of interesting difference would also be the fact that cultural buildings usually anchor and spearhead urban regeneration projects or urban development. Cairns are at the core of, of developmental areas as opposed to in isolation in, 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 you know, in seemingly remote nature. So. But they're always part of the same kind of regional field. Yeah, I mean, clearly. Uh, um, there is an understanding of, uh, of urbanism which <coughs> brings with it uh, the advent of the regional metropolis as opposed to something which is I don't know, in the 19th century, the Cité. So clearly, yeah. Um. I mean, I, I'm aware that I'm in danger of kind of smoothing over all differences for the sake of um, kind of constantly coming <coughs> back to uh, the universalization that, that you were talking about, um, Valeria. And I suppose that's because uh, one of the things that I was pondering um, was how you, you, you um, suggested that this had a link to parametric design. Um, I think so many things <coughs> come under the label of parametric design, um, which are not meant to be the most anything, but um, it did seem to me that uh, one of the things that the all those tabulations of CIA and four in 1933 didn't do was to uh, turn their tabulations into yeah. things that were being seen as um, sort of continuous variables. And I'm wondering to, to what extent you think they were or they weren't and what processes one would need to go through to get from the kind of taxonomic organization that you see um, in the tables of the functional city to actually being able to correlate those um, because obviously when Hayek comes up with his price index, he is um, using that as something It has become a continuous variable into which various other variables has, have been folded. And in order to do that, he has had to turn other things into particular types of variables. Um, do you think that the um, protagonists of the functional city stepped back from doing that? Or um, I don't think so. I use the, the CIM, I mean, exactly the tabula array just for discussing this way of uh, organizing the information. Um, and the, convi the, convi the conviction that was put into that way of organizing information, um, the way that uh, statistics operate at that moment, of course, it's, it's into variables and correlations. Um, but that's why I try to manage the idea of um, of the tabular array exactly as this um, as this uh, symbol structure into which architects can approach uh, the organization of a space. In, in that sense, I, I use uh, um, the tabular array, and and then I uh, try to make a sort of uh, difference from uh, <coughs> the way Hayek about information. And it's also about not the single 
authority or the center of all, all the mighty, all, what to do. I mean, we are going to make the city in this way, but instead, it's a different, uh, a, a different individual or a different uh, subject as at stake, using uh, information in a different way because it is necessary uh, the individual food or a different food in a different. In a different, um, it's it is it becomes necessary to operate in a different way. And I mean, the the effect of in of artifacts operating <coughs> information that is uh, important to to kind of emphasize in in the in the comparison between CIM and parametric. I think I would probably say more of a continuity then. Um, mm -hmm. And I can sort of hint at why I'm saying more of a continuity. If, if you read, um, well, a, a shorthand way of describing <coughs> it might be the uh, interests going on at the same time as the functioning of city through something like the League of Nations mm -hmm. in um, literally the indexing of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not talking here about index cards full of facts and actually the indexing of uh, different categories of fact and opinion um, in a way to see w with the idea that this somehow allowed for a universal knowledge mm -hmm. but it's not a knowledge that's actually owned by one person or sort of imposed <coughs> from above it's a knowledge that is in the ideals of um, the people at the League of Nations is, is actually more in tune with Hayek's feedback loops, um, though without resorting to actual numerical indices. Um, and I'm not quite clear how the other group will do it, but anyway. Um, I do have more individual specific questions, but if, if I mean, I'd much rather open things up now. Um, one of the, I, I think it's been interesting uh, using first one and then another paper as a fulcrum for the other two, and so I'll, I'll continue with that if I can. Um, if, if, I, if I put Ava's paper in the center, the thing that strikes me about it is that you were perhaps the, the one to make the most forceful judgment uh, about um, the standing of a particular project. And uh, <coughs> in a way, what enabled you to do that was to position uh, the sanatorium right in the middle of, uh, of some fairly clear discursive patterns. So th 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 it should work in relation to a medical reason, and it should work in relation to an urban reason, and particularly at the regional scale. And so we can place it there in, in such a way that we uh, start to ask questions, what should it do? And then we might ask that, uh, has it been effectively or correctly determined? Um, now, if we, if we take one of those elements and, and bring it closer over to Valerius, in, in a way, what's interesting is that you were placing the idea of vocabular reasoning uh, in relation to reasoning in general general almost, rather than in relation to any particular discursive formation. And so it starts to function there as a kind of pattern of reasoning that can be used by any number of, uh, uh, of disciplines. Uh, and, and so then it seems as though it kind of floats, but in fact it's also uh, an, an instrument for being able to do experimentation. So you start to notice that it gives rise to a kind of parametric reasoning where we can see the possibility of treating uh, these parameters as though they are subject to a kind of ability to, uh, to, uh, to develop new forms, develop new ways of approaching the city. And that seems to me to be what the way in which Pavlos is trying to treat architecture, that is, architecture should be a kind of projective, experimental, diagnostic testing of a set of possibilities with the city. 
if, if we kind of bring these together, then I think one of the things that we might come back and ask in relation to Ava's judgment is, uh, is it really true that, the, uh, that as you move through the sanatoria, there is a move away from nature? <coughs> Now, we might take something of the kind of uh, reasoning that Valeria's paper has pointed up and suggested that maybe there's a way of understanding nature through multiple organizations of parameters, such that the ground is not so much the thing that ties together all the parameters of nature. Or indeed, uh, along Pavlis's lines, if we take Colhoun's points about uh, Corbusier, there's no particular um, uh, ground to the ground, we might say. Uh, so in that sense, we, we might, it, it may not be that we move away from nature as we redefine both ground and nature. And, and so in that sense, the, the architectures become more experimental, opening up possibilities, which I think is something that you've seen typically in the way in which that, uh, those types migrate into other genres of building and start to be used in other urban situations that you've talked about in, in, in other times and other settings. So I'm just wondering if, if we, in a way what we're seeing here is, is a possibility of a conversation emerging around the, uh, the rationalities of experimentation. difference, as I kind of tried to point out in, in the paper, and I, I mean, of course, we can argue that um, in becoming universal, it sort of universally opened up to the outside, but it lost, and that, that was what I wanted to say, it lost the, the attachment to the particular site, which I think, you know, was, was really a central issue to... Um, buildings such as the Baelic, you know, we, we try to really use the site as a means to, uh, to help with the cure. If it was not one main uh, thing, really, which was, which was this natural site, which you know, was meaningful at that time. So I, I still would show it as, as you know, it's becoming universal. Have you been working with a particular definition of hygienic? as that which you know you can help on a, like in a broader sense of course also we, we see it today as that which is you know isolating you know that which is um, I'm, I'm not just referring to it as cleanliness clean, can you say clean, cleanliness in that sense but just as the major um, understanding of, of maintaining health I suppose what I'm thinking is that um, if one sees it in that maintaining health way, I, I think a particularly 19th century way of looking at hygienicness is, is actually that it's very much to do with something that's reciprocal with its environment, that it's um, to do with a, a healthy relationship with the environment. Um, in, like in the sense of that reconciliation with own nature. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I would say that was in some way, yeah. So hygienic also in the sense of, you know, getting like the sunlight, getting again back to the Alps and where where one belongs and out of out of sort of the, the metropolis. Well I, I was actually thinking about this in relation to, to Larry's 
I'd like to consider whether it's a matter of what happens when you proceed from the hygien hygienic interior to a hygienic exterior. Um, the germ theory uh, about illness, uh, which leads to the movement for radical cleansing, begins with the particular and its ambience, the room, the body, the operating table, the chamber, and that's why the interiors of Berlitz already look cool, new, modern, long before its exterior. Um, but the germ theory also uh, uncovered the domain of public health and of so socialized hygiene. Now, um, this struck me very clearly because I, I was reading a right-wing website that was absolutely vituperating against uh, uh, all public health movements and trace it back to Virchow in the 19th century and uh, his, his, uh, his, his, his advocacy of, of public health measures. Now, as you move from the particular in terms of design to the widespread and the general, you have to move to planning. And this is where I got slightly puzzled by uh, Hayek's position. Hayek, as I understand it, is associated with um, uh, a, a, a critique of, of planning, indeed of, of, uh, of the very idea of possibility of planning. Uh, on the other hand, presumably, he's not a critic of design. At some point, design transits into planning. It might be a matter of, of scale uh, and relation in the exterior uh, realm, but it will also be a matter of time and of going forward. At some point, functionalism um, <coughs> ceases to be or has to cease to be a merely linear uh, uh, deduction <coughs> of an immediate uh, ambience and has to uh, proceed to some kind of strategic ordering uh, of things. And it seems to me that in moving from the particular to the general, to the nominal, to the universal, and then moving from the object to the city, one encounters a kind of crisis of functionalism. Um, and I, I should imagine that uh, Hayek's uh, economics and social theory <coughs> is somehow insert in a certain sub of this frame. But I'm not sure exactly, I mean, what, what this, wh whether actually the modern movement in architecture has, has really picked it up. It seemed to me that, that what was at stake um, is about the category of information and especially about translatability of information. Because when you talk about um, uh, when you talk about the Guggenheim, you know, it, it's talked about in some sense as a centerpiece in a kind of redevelopment. Mm -hmm. But somehow, how it's supposed to operate in terms of stated like that. But, and the question really here is whether such a cultural center is thought of as a kind of material object which will then be part of a kind of urban structure of whatever kind. <coughs> or whether it's some kind of attractor for finance. In which case it will now, it, it would be just as important to say that as an attractor uh, Bilbao would only be possible on the ground that Bilbao City owns the water tank, that is to say, and you know, by increasing the value uh, of that water pump, it would be all the more of the revenue that would make development possible. Now, I think that's where kind of Hayek comes in, because Hayek uh, is concerned to argue that there is only one stable source of information, and it's money. I mean, that is to say, it's a price. Therefore, as it were, you know, um, in terms of urban development, 
one should just treat everyone as a kind of customer or a provider, whatever, and let the market take place. By contrast, kind of CM, as it were, is committed to a kind of information which imagines that development will, will progress through a concern with sort of material quantities and whatever and distribution. And then the question is, while that of course used to be feasible under some notion of socialist kind of planning, where you're not talking about socialism at all, where you're talking about planning within a market economy, the question is, how do those, how do those translate? And I think that, that, as you rightly said, ends up in the question of certain kind of parametric strategies now. Hayek says at the end, you couldn't have a better system than the pure market unless you could invent a machine that could do hundreds of thousands of differential equations in a single day. Ah, 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 well, of course you can have that. And, and so, you know, in some sense, you know, there's, there's a kind of recent transformation through the computer. clear to say, well you said it in your written paper, I can't remember whether you spoke it, um, that the Baylux sanatorium um, belonged to an insurance company, which yes. was a state insurance company. And I was wondering about the other sanatoria, and are they all state-run businesses, or who are the clients? Who are the sanatoria? Who are the paying Man proposes, God disposes. The question is now, who or what disposes? 